Welcome everyone to the Chicago Football Connection Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Letizia. You can follow me on Twitter at CFC Bears. Uh, for this week's podcast, I decided to look at one of the more polarizing players on the Bears. Um, that is Cole Komet, tight end. Um, a lot of Bears fans and national media um, think that he's an ascending tight end. You know, he had 60 receptions for 612 yards in a bad offensive scheme last year, um, which is an you know, improvement from his rookie year. So a lot of people think that he's an ascending tight end, and in a new offense, he could potentially improve on those stats. There's even some people on Twitter, I won't name names, but a prominent Bears draft guy who thinks that um, 800 yards and 8 TDs is his floor. Um, but then there's a lot of people on Twitter and a lot of Bears fans, a lot of national media, who think he's not a good tight end, uh, not a good, at least not receiving-wise. Um, so I decided to take a look for myself. You know, obviously I watch every Bears game live, but I wanted to look at the All-22. I wanted to look in, into his stats. I wanted to kind of just see for myself where Cole Komet lies um, in terms of his value to an NFL team. Is he a bad tight end? Is he a good tight end? Um, you know, how is he used? How did the Bears use him under Matt Nagy? How could he potentially be used in Luke Getze's scheme? Um, I did a deep dive, if you missed it, on Luke Getze's scheme, both the rushing attack and the passing attack. I could put those links in the description here if you want to uh, review those. But I took a look at um, Cole Komet with that kind of lens. Um, again, I did a statistical dive as well. Uh, I watched every snap of, uh, of uh, Cole Komet's this last season. Um, I also um, posted it on Twitter a um, a link to a video that includes all of Cole Komet's receptions for 2021. Um, so I'll post that in the comments and the description as well, so you can view all of his um, all of his receptions. So um, that being said, again, I wanted to kind of get deep get um, into it and just see kind of what Cole Komet can bring to this team going forward, where he was in the past, and what things are going to look like uh, in Luke Getze's new offense. The first thing before I got into his actual tape is I looked at his stats. I wanted to see how his stats compared to other players uh, at the same position. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there's a lot of talk of people saying, you know, 60 receptions for 612 yards, it's only going to get better from there, um, you know, which makes sense. Um, you know, at first glance, you think, you know, he, he had, what, I think like 28 receptions as a rookie, 60 receptions last year. It would make sense that he would have 70, 80 receptions next year. Um, but I wanted to kind of see uh, where he was at in comparison to to other players. So I put together um, his stats next to the other top tight ends in 2021 to kind of see where he ranked. Um, so I put together this little chart here. Um, so this is the top 19 tight ends from 2021. Um, so those are the the um, the tight ends with enough tight um, targets to qualify for. Um, these stats. So if you look, you have Cole Komet kind of near the bottom here. In targets, he was 11th um, out of 19. Um, receptions, he was 17th. Yards, 15th. Uh, TDs, obviously he didn't have any, so he's going to be bo bottom there. Um, so he's tied for, that should be uh, 19th, not 29th. Um, yards per target, 6.88. That was 18th. Catch percentage, 15th. Receiving grade, that's PFF receiving grade, 63.4. Um, 18th um, yards after catch and, and so on and so forth. Um, so you can see he's pretty much in the bottom six, um, in every category besides the tar besides targets and average depth of target. Um, so and it wasn't very good, um, no matter kind of how you slice it for Cole Komet in 2021, uh, when you compare him to the other tight ends, um, top tight ends in the league. Um, so I know what a lot of people are going to say. Um, a lot of prop uh, proponents of Cole Komet are going to say, well, you know, he was a sophomore tight end this was only his second year in the league um you know so th again things are going to get better as he gets more comfortable in, in in the nfl as he gets more comfortable in offense as he gets into a better offense which is completely fair i do think that he has some room to grow room to grow but i i wanted to um look at cole Komet's stats and compare them to other tight ends in their sophomore season or second year in the league um so when i did that i expected it to be a little bit better and it actually was not much better um so i took a look at these are 30 tight ends, um, a lot of the tight ends that you saw on the last list, um, and then a couple other tight ends, um, so mostly guys who are in the league currently or just recently retired. Um, so I have 30 tight ends here, so you can kind of see where Cole Komet ranks. Um, it's sorted by target right now, so he's at the top. So he was actually 7th in targets um, among second-year tight ends, 10th in, in receptions, and 13th in yards. So if you just look at those numbers for second-year tight ends, it's not—it's pretty good. Um, you would expect, you know, it's a top ten 
top 12 tight end um, with some pretty good names in, uh, ahead of him there, like Jimmy Graham, Jason Witten, Rob Gronkowski, George Kittle, Mark Andrews, TJ Atkinson. Those are some really good tight ends that Polkamath's probably never going to, you know, live up to those names. So the fact that he's, you know, right behind those guys in terms of reception and yards in his sophomore season is encouraging. Um, what's not encouraging is when you look at the other stats in this list, because um, volume stats can also, um, can often lie or, or be deceiving. Um, what is harder to be deceiving is these these next couple stats. So obviously touchdowns, um, he, had, he didn't have one last year, so he's tied for 29th on this list. I'm not as concerned about that, to be honest. I think touchdowns can be a little bit fluky. Um, I do. I would bet on him having at least one touchdown next year, so I'm not too worried about that. What concerns me more is these next numbers. Uh, the yards per target was 24th among these players. Um, receiving grade, again, that's PFF, um, 23rd. Yards after catch per reception, 23rd. Yards per run, 22nd. Um, drop percentage, average depth target is pretty middle of the pack. Passer rating when targeted is 27th. Again, that is a little bit skewed by the lack of touchdown numbers because uh, touchdowns greatly increase passer rating. Uh, so I'm not too concerned about that. But those yards per out run, yards after catch per reception, yards per target, receiving grade, those are all very concerning to me. Um, obviously, you know, that can get better. Um, so um, I want, so I looked at those stats and obviously, you know, I wasn't really impressed with them. The, um, the total numbers, you know, the 67, 60 receptions for 612 yards weren't terrible. Um, so, but really not um, very, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Impressive or, you know, doesn't instill me with a lot of confidence moving forward after seeing those stats. But I decided to, you know, keep digging. So I wanted to see, you know, how he was used in the Bears offense. Um, so I want to see, like, where he was targeted, what kind of routes he ran, Um his stats when looking at down and distances, stacks versus man coverage or zone coverage, stuff like that. So this is when I started watching every um, snap of his in, in 2021. Um, and I I put this next thing together, a target chart. There, uh, PFF also has target charts, but I wanted to um, put my own together um, because while I love PFF, I use a lot of their information um, all the time and a lot of information in these next couple um, charts that I have. I wanted to put my own together because I watched every single snap they took. I watched every single target he took. Um, so I was able to kind of put together a target chart on where he was used in this offense. So if I pull that up, you'll see most of his receptions and targets came within 10 yards of the, of, of the line of scrimmage. Um, so he had, let's see, 20, um, he won 44 receptions in between 0, zero and um, 10 yards, and he had four receptions behind the line of scrimmage. So that's 48 receptions that he had just with either behind the line of scrimmage or within 10 yards. Um, he had, had only one reception that traveled more than 20 yards in the air, and that's something else I should mention here. This is um, yards in the air. So he had yard, uh, receptions that went for more than 20 yards, but he caught them in, um, before that 20-yard mark, if that makes sense. So you can see he was used mostly on underneath throughouts. Um, that's kind of what you expect out of a tight end, especially in an offense that wasn't very explosive. Um, it's a little bit uh, unfair to say Cole Komet's bad because he didn't catch a lot of receptions over 20 yards when the entire Bears offense, not many players cut. There weren't many plays in general that went over 20 yards for the Bears last year. Um, so that's a little bit unfair to say that just because he wasn't used that way in 2021, that doesn't necessarily mean he can't be used that way going forward. Um, I will say, based on watching him, um, he's not, you know, and, and and this is not a hot take at all. I think most Bears fans would agree with this. He's not an explosive player. Um, he's not shifty. You know, he doesn't, his three-cone drill at the combine was pretty poor. He does have pretty decent straight line speed, um, so he can use be used to attack that seam, but he's not going to, you know, be ru running routes 20 yards downfield and getting open consistently. Um, he's going to be more of a guy who uses his straight line speed and uses his size to box out defenders rather than making guys miss. Um, so here, this is pretty much the same information, just in a chart format. It's a little bit easier to read. Um, so you can see, again, 44 receptions, either behind the line of scrimmage or within 10 yards of the line of, of, the line of scrimmage. That's where most of his production came from. Um, if you see uh, his percent of targets... Uh, it's 4.3% beyond the last scrimmage, 68% between 0 and 10 yards. So that's over 70, almost 73%. There's actually over 73% 
um, of his targets came within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. And if you look at his percent of, re of receptions, it's 80%, um, exactly 80% of his receptions came um, less than 10 yards um, from the line of scrimmage. So that's obviously not a player that is, you know, threatening the defense very much. A um, lot of underneath stuff for Cole Komet last year. Um, again, percentage of yards, even though, you know, you would expect, you know, more uh, longer passes to result in more yards. He still only had, you know, over 60% of his yards came uh, less than 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. So again, something that doesn't instill you with a lot of confidence. Um, the other thing I did, though, uh, is with that depth of tar targets, I looked at his routes. Um, so I wanted to see what routes he was running, um, where he's running them, and, and everything like that. So if we pull up the next one, we have uh, all the routes that he ran. So he ran corner route, a couple corner routes, cross, curl, dig, drag, flat, out, post, screen, seam, slant, and wheel. So a majority of his production and targets came on two routes. Uh, you got curls and flats. Now, we, anyone who's watched a Bears game in the last three, four years, however long Nagy's been coach, coaching, you know the Bears loved to run a lot of curl routes. It wasn't just tight ends running curls. It was wide receivers running curls. And it's frustrating, to say the least. Now, curls are always going to be a part of any NFL offense. But the, at the rate that the Bears ran it is just ridiculous. It made them very predictable. Um, if you, again, look at here running curls and flats pretty much exclusively, um, so that just, you know, there's not a lot of nuance to these to these routes. Not a lot of area uh, op opportunities for Cole Komet to make something happen on a curl route or a flat route. There's only so much you can do with those particular targets. Um, if you get him running more drags or corners or seams, there's a lot more you can do with that to get open. A lot more opportunities for run after the catch on like drags and digs and crossers. Um, but you can see that, you know, it, it's mostly curls and just, you know, going out of the flat. Um, he was pretty um, uh, pretty adept at the corner route. That was something that he ran pretty well. Um, he only did, had five targets on the corner route, but caught two of them for 41 yards. Pretty good yards per reception, pretty good yards per target, and very good depth of target, obviously. Um, so that's something that he might be able to run a little bit more. Um, I'd like to see him run a lot more dig routes, um, working over the middle of the field. I don't think he's going to be a guy who works... Uh, he ran ten. He had ten targets on out routes, but only one on a dig route. That's pretty crazy to me. Um, I don't know why you'd want to have Cole Komet not working over the middle of the field given his size. Um, so I'd love to see more dig routes from him. Um, and I'd also love to see you know more screens. Um, and we'll get in. I'll get into screens a little bit later. Uh, but you can see you know this isn't a very diverse route tree that Matt Nagy had Cole Komet running. And you know. I don't know if we want him running a hugely diverse route tree because he's not a great route runner, uh, but I can certainly see him running more drags, um, more crossers, more digs, more screens, and a lot more seam routes because he does have the size and the speed to kind of threaten uh, the, the field vertically over the middle of the field. So, again, that's kind of a, an issue of it is a little bit of the scheme. It's a little bit of his, you know, ability to get open. Um, so, uh, um like I said, it's 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 kind of a bit of a both when people say, you know, is he a good tight end? Is he a bad tight end? Was he limited by the by the by the um, scheme? The answer to the, all those questions is yes. Um, he was limited by the scheme just based on how predictable it was and the lack of route trees that he was running. But he was also limited by his own limitations. You know, he's not a super shifty guy. He's not gonna you know beat man coverage. Um, so it's a little bit of both. Um, but I think. There are some areas where he um, has shown some flashes, like on those corner routes, um, to get open. Uh, normally against zone, not so much against man, but I think there is some things that he showed last year that he can build upon going forward. The next thing I wanted to look at is where his reproduction was coming from, at what point in the games, um, and I want to look at down, distance, differential, uh, because when I was watching um, his snaps, it, just, it seemed to me that a lot of his receptions and targets were coming at inconsequential points of the game, either on third and longs, on underneath passes, or when we were down big, he was catching passes. So I wanted to um, kind of put together a chart to see where, how productive he was and how, um, how he helped the team. Was he helping the team just in garbage time? Was he getting a lot of garbage time stats? Was he actually moving the chain when it mattered? Um, so I put together this chart, um, which shows 
you know, his value when he was catching passes by down. So first down a lot. Most of his receptions did come on first down. No, nothing wrong with that. Um, he did not have as many catches on third and fourth down. Um, and you can see his average depth of target as well. The thing that stood out to me is I have the edge of average depth of, depth of target and I have the distance to the first down sticks. So you can see on first down and then the column next to the distance is um, the average depth of target minus the distance. So you can see on first down, he caught the ball on average three yards shy of the of the sticks, so about seven yards. Um, on third and fourth down, that's when it gets really concerning because on third and fourth down, you should be catching the ball beyond the sticks uh, for a first down, or at least be targeted beyond the sticks for a first down. But on average, he was catching the ball two and a half yards in front of the, the first down marker, uh, which, you know, isn't good. So that led me to believe that, you know, I was right when I was thinking a lot of his production was coming against, uh, or uh, coming at times of the game, you know, um, at inco inconsequential times of the game. When the, uh, if you look at the next one, the distance, the first down marker, um, nine of his receptions for 105 yards came with, when, uh, on a down a distance of 15 plus yards. Uh, so when it was second and 15, third and 15, first and 15, whatever it was, nine of his receptions came in 105 yards came from that point. So that's obviously, you know, one sixth of his production came um, when the, it didn't really matter. And, and he, this wasn't receptions that were going for 15 plus yards in a first down. His average yards per his yards per target was only seven. His average depth of target was 7.6. Um, so average depth of target 7.6 on 15 plus yard. That's, you know, seven yards short of the of the first down marker. So that's really just check downs on third and long or second and long, whatever it is. Um, um, so that's, you know, a sixth, sixth of his production is, you know, pretty inconsequential just by looking at that. Um, if you look at the one down here, this is in point differential. Um, 25 of his receptions came when we were down eight or more points. Now, when you're down, you know, 10 points, 14 points. It's obviously still a ball game, so those are not meaningless receptions by any means. Um, but he does have, you know, five receptions when you're down more than two touchdowns. So, again, um, not really inspiring a lot of confidence when looking at these stats. Um, uh, but, it, it, you know, it, it is also part, partly to do with scheme because the Bears were down in the games a lot, you know, Polkamet isn't playing defense and allowing us to get down 30 plus points. So it's hard to blame him for that when he's catching passes when we're down 30. Um, so I don't completely blame him for that. Um, the other thing I wanted to look at is the other thing I was watching was um, how he performed against different coverage schemes. So man versus zone coverage. Um, if you uh, follow um, Tom Cavanaugh on Twitter, um, he's come on the podcast a few times. Really great. Bears follow. He um, looked at all the bear, all of Cole Komet's targets, or, or not just targets, all of Cole Komet's routes versus man coverage, um, and he posted a video about that, which is you know very helpful. So if you want to um, look at that, go go follow uh, Tom Cavanaugh, Tommy K underscore NFL Draft. I think it's something like that. Um, so I found his receiving yards, uh, receiving stats versus man coverage, and his receiving stats versus zone coverage, and it's not great. Uh, for Cole Komet. Um, he, but he, he had 15 targets against man coverage, nine receptions, only 68 yards against zone, 46 receptions, 468 yards. Um, so obviously not, um, he's obviously much better against zone than he against, is against man. His yards per reception is much higher against zone. Yards per targets higher. Um, yards after catch perception is higher and his yards per route run is a lot higher against zone. The thing that confused me is yards after catch per reception in theory, your yards after catch per reception should be better against man coverage uh, because if you're on like a drag route, you can get going. Zone coverage, it's more of you catch the ball and you're surrounded by guys. So that was curious to see that his yards after catch per reception was actually lower against zone coverage against ma than man coverage. I think that goes to show just how poor he was uh, against man coverage um, in 2021. That's definitely something that he needs to improve upon. He's not a great route runner. Um, but at the same time, you don't when you have when you're six six, two hundred sixty pounds, you don't need to be a really great route runner to be productive against man coverage. What he needs to do is he needs to be be better about using his straight line speed and using his size to box out defenders rather than creating huge separation. You know, you know, he's not a wide receiver. He's not going to be you know breaking people's ankles when he's running routes. It's the subtle movements in his route running, using his head to kind of get 
cornerbacks thinking he's going the other direction before going the other way. Um, kind of just the nuances of route running is where he really needs to improve. Um, and then using his body um, to box out defenders. Use that size. He's a bit of a body catcher. If you can use his hands a little bit more to extend them up away from his body. Too many times he let smaller cornerbacks get their hands um, around him and, and break up a play. Um, I have one example here. Let me see if I can find it. Oh man, where is it? Okay, well I don't have an example of it, but um, you, you'll I, I can put it in in the next uh, part of the video. Uh, but you'll see um, that he has very rounded routes and just has cornerbacks draped all over him and able to get their hands around him. He just needs to do a better job of uh, boxing out and using his size to an advantage because that is um, how tight ends usually win is with their size. The mismatch isn't really with the speed so much. Um, linebackers are going to be just as fast as tight ends. Cornerbacks can be faster than tight ends. Your advantage comes from your size, um, and Kolkomat definitely is one of the bigger tight ends in the NFL. Um, and if he learns to kind of work and use his size a little bit better, he could still be a good uh, tight end against man coverage. Um, he just has a little bit of work to do. All right, so I got that video now of Kolkomat um, to show how he telegraphs his route and rounds his route routes off. So you can see that he's highlighted there in the slot, and you can see how he rounds off that route and allows not only rounds off his route but allows a smaller cornerback to get over him to break up the play. So if we watch that again. And see how he's he's looking where he's going before he actually makes his break and the cornerback can see that um and he's able to break on it but at the same time this should be an easy completion still because cole commits 6'6 260 pounds that cornerback is you know six foot at best 200 pounds got 60 pounds on him and, and, and six inches at least so he should be able to box him out for uh, an easy catch the other thing that you see about this is um, another reason why this should be an easy completion is because you have your cornerback playing outside leverage on the call command. You'll see he actually moves over a little bit. He's playing outside leverage here, so it slant over the middle with no one over the middle should be an easy completion, 10 times out of 10, easy 7, 10 yards. Um, but because he sells his route so much, he allows the cornerback to go from outside leverage over to the other side of the ball to make a play on the ball. Um, again, that should be just an easy completion. Um, 10 times out of 10 or 9 times out of 10 for an easy completion over the middle. Um, how about your quarterback a little bit? That being said, as I mentioned, he doesn't need to be a great route runner to be successful. There's a lot of times on tape where he, you know, catches the ball without creating huge amounts of separation because, again, he's 6'6", 260 pounds. So this is a good example of that. Um, this is kind of this, another slant, so a similar play. Um, where he just uses his size a lot better. He's again isn't a great route runner here, but um, you can see he's at the top of the screen there. But you can see how he gets he's being pressed, uses his length, and is able to create enough separation and box out the cornerback to make a catch on that slant. So that's what he needs to do more. Um, needs to be a little bit more physical with his routes, use that size to his advantage. Um, he did the same thing. This is a video from 2020, so his rookie year. Um, it's on the on the touchdown. Uh, so you can see he's lined up in line here. And it's kind of the same thing. Um, just the way he uses his size, there's advantage to box out that corner, that safety. There's no, that safety doesn't have a chance to make a play on the ball because Okamath's using his size to box him out and, you know, prevent him from, from getting his hands in there. And it's an easy touchdown over the middle for Okamath. So again, he just has to use more of that. Um, if we look at, this is just an alternate angle of that same play. Uh, but you can see, watch the safety. He's just not able to get around the big body Komet uh, to make a play on the ball there. And then this is one of my favorite plays of his uh, from 2021. This is a, a play where he's in, in man coverage. It's either man coverage or, or, or they're playing a cover two. I can't remember. But either way, this uh, Eric Hendricks, the linebacker, is running with him the entire way. Um, so it's essentially man coverage. And Fields can see that over the middle that he has the size advantage and just throws a high ball, puts it up for his um, tight end to get it. Matt uses his size. You, he has Another thing he has is great body control um, for a guy his size. Usually you don't see these tight ends who can jump and turn and catch the ball at the same time. Um, maybe smaller tight ends, but not guys called Matt's size. So I think his body control is actually one of the better um, in terms of tight ends that I've seen. Um, I, maybe not. Maybe that's a slight exaggeration. Maybe not one of the betters, but good for a guy who hasn't been as productive as, as he has. 
Uh, so that's an area that he can that the Bears can definitely exploit going forward with that body control, his big ha uh, big uh, body and good hands. Um, so those are the videos that I was trying to show earlier. Um, the other thing I want, so now I've kind of got a good idea of where, where he wins, what kind of routes he runs, um, where he's targeted, and, and how everything works in the within the Bears scheme. Um, so I wanted to project him forward a little bit. So what I did is I looked at tight ends, um, other tight ends in similar offenses. And I've talked about this on the other ones, but similar offenses would be the Packers. Obviously, Luke Getze coming from the Packers, um, the Rams, and the 49ers. Um, 49ers are a little skewed because George Kittle is one of the best tight ends in the in the NFL. Easily one of the best tight ends in the NFL. Easily top three. Um, so his numbers get a little skewed because of that. Uh, but they do run a similar offense to what the Bears will be running this upcoming year. So I wanted to look at him. So I looked at, I did a comparison um, of all these riders, uh, of all these tight ends, these different offenses. Um, so you can see at the top, we have the West Coast tight end production comparison. Um, in 2021, for the Packers, you had Robert Tanya and J Josiah DeGuara. Tanya got hurt halfway through, so I kind of combined their stats into one player. Um, then you have Robert Tanya in 2020. Our buddy Jimmy Graham in 2019, um, when he was on the Packers, uh, he was washed up then. He was and then came to the Bears and was continued to, to be washed up. Um, and then you had Tyler Higby, um, the tight end for the Rams, the last three years. And then I used George Kittle's just 2021 because he was injured injured in 2020. I, and his 2019 was ridiculous. So I just used uh, the 2021 for George Kittle. Um, one thing I will mention from watching this is Tyler Higby is a lot better than I thought he was. Um, I feel like in my fantasy draft, I'm going to be targeting Tyler Higby because he's actually like really, really good. And I didn't expect that. So that's just a little little side note there. Uh, but you can see the target shares for these players. Uh, for the Packers, Tanyan and Dogara last year, ten just over 10%. Robert Tanyan in 2020, 11.7%. Jimmy Graham in 2019, 11.26%. Uh, everyone's pretty much around that. If you look at Cole Komet, he was at a 17.59% target share in 2021 for the Bears. That is way too high for Cole Komet. Um, e even this, his staunchest defenders should should realize that he needs to be closer to that 10, 11, 12% uh, target share. I mean, George Kittle was at a 19%. There's no reason George Kittle and Cole Komet should be 1.5% off in target shares. Um, so that number for Cole Komet needs to come down. But if you look at the targets... Um, you know, Cole Komet, again, had 89 targets in 2021. That's more than, that's will be third on this list. More than Robert Tanyan had in, in 2020, more than Jimmy Graham, more than Tyler Higby in one of his years, uh, more than Tanyan and Aguara this year. Um, so again, that target share is just just way too high for a player of Cole Komet's caliber. Uh, he should be much more of a 17.59% a target share is like a second option. Um, he should be much closer to that 10, 11, 12% target share. Um, you could just go down the list. You could see um, the yards after catch for reception, um, the yards per target. Every single one of them is higher than what Cole Komet had in 2021. Um, yards after catch per reception, everyone is higher than Cole Komet yards per route run. Um, most of them are higher than Cole Komet with, with the exception of a, a few. So you can see that even though um, the the receptions and yards might not be as high, it's those advanced stats that um, Cole Komet can definitely improve on. And in being in this offense, you can see how these players are used. You can see how it's easy for Cole Komet to improve just based on just based on being in a, in a better scheme. So definitely what I came... I mean, I knew this kind of going into it, but I knew the Bears scheme was poor, um, but this kind of just cemented it um, Matt Nagy had no business being a head coach for as long as he did um, he was a great head coach in terms of you know managing a locker room and stuff like that and the players liked him but in terms of scheme and offense he had no business doing that as long as he did uh, but if and then if you look at the other thing that surprised me um, is the tight end alignments and how where these tight ends are lining up um, in their offense so if you look here we have, um, if you look at the route percentage, Hulk Matt ran the ran a route eighty three point three percent of the time. That's one of the higher numbers here. Um, if you look at the inline percentage, so how often they lined up in line, Hulk Matt only lined up in line as an inline tight end. That's a tight end that's lining up on the line of scrimmage rather than split out wide or in the slot, thirty five percent of the time. Um, for a guy who's six six two sixty, two sixty five two seventy, whatever he is. He should be lining up in in line most of the time. And if you look at all of these different players, 
every single one of these players lined up in line more than Cole Komet did. And that includes Jimmy Graham, who lined up in line 37% of the time. And Jimmy Graham has always been a, is a better wide receiver than he was a tight end. Um, so there's no reason that Cole Komet should be lining up in line less than Jimmy Graham. Um, and that's Jimmy Graham on the Packers in 2019, not Jimmy Graham on the Bears. Uh, but you can see he lined up, lined up out wide 14% of the time. That's, again, um, higher than George Kittle lined up out wide. Um, and no one's going to say that um, Polkamat's a better wide receiver than, than George Kittle. If you look at in the slot, 47.6% of the time, Polkamat lined up in the slot in 2021. That's higher than every single player on this list. So you can see just the way he was used. He was used like a tight end who is an elite receiver, and he's just not. And he's never going to be an elite receiver. But that's how he was utilized. Um, so it's hard to blame a lot of this on Cole Komet, his maybe lack of production and lack of stats on Cole Komet, because the scheme just did not, they were using him just in a way that doesn't make any goddamn sense, to be honest. Um, so hopefully, um, you know, in, in Luke Getz's scheme, they can find a way to utilize his skills a little bit more, maybe not make him a focal point of the offense um, like he was in 2021, which he should never be, uh, make him a third or fourth option, um, and scheme ways to get him the ball rather than try and put him out wide or in the slot and say, hey, go beat your man and and get open and we'll throw you the ball. Like, that's not going to be his game. Um, but I, I do think there are ways that they, the Packers, uh, I'm sorry, the Bears can use him based on what the Packers have done in the past, based on what the Rams have done in the past. Um, a really interesting thing that I found is uh, his production, uh, West Coast offense tight ends uh, screen produ productions. Uh, so you would see here, we have Kolkmet in 2021 and had 28 yards on four receptions on screen passes in 2021. Um, if you look at these other players, Higby had 14 receptions for 110 yards. Dewar and Tanya had 13 receptions for 151 yards. Even George Kittle, they, they threw screens to him to kind of get him involved in the offense and get him easy yards and easy receptions. Even he had 80 uh, yards and eight receptions. Um, if you look at the percentage of the targets, um, Dewar and Tanya, 22% of their targets came on just screens. Um, just kind of short passes to get them the ball. Only 4.35% of Cole Komet. Even Tyler, um, Tyler Higby, 16%. Uh, percentage of receptions, percentage of yards. These are just easy ways to get your players involved in the offense. Get them. Uh, it not only helps these tight ends, but it helps your quarterback. Um, and when they talk about a quarterback-friendly offense, this is what they're talking about, those screens um, and getting the ball into your playmaker's hands, getting the ball out, more importantly, out of your quarterback's hands so he doesn't take a lot of hits. Um, it's going to help your, um, those screen passes help your offensive line. We know the, op the Bears offensive line is going to be a work in progress in 2021. Um, those screen passes can certainly help. And getting Cole Komet involved there is just another way to do that. And so this is an example of a, a screen that the, the Packers ran in 20, um, I believe this is actually 2020. Oops, back up. Okay. So this is a tight end delay screen. So what you have here is you have three um, receivers at the top of the screen. You have a running back in the backfield who you're going to send um, in motion. And then you have Robert Tani by himself on the right side of the screen. Um, so what they're going to do is they're going to run uh, clear out. Uh, the wide receivers at the top are going to run go routes and, and a little bubble screen. And the running back in the, in the backfield is going to run is going to be sent in motion and what that is going to do is going to move the the linebackers that the lions have away from robert tanyan and towards that running back who's who's uh in motion which just sets it up for an easy screen to robert tanyan uh for a big game uh, it's these type of things that are just very simple very easy that the bears just never did um uh, I shouldn't say never did, but didn't do enough and didn't do effectively because when they did do it, they were just too predictable in what they were trying to do. Uh, when the bear, this is an example of a screen that the Bears ran very often, and I'm sorry for giving everyone PTSD from seeing this play because Matt Nagy loved this play and it never worked. Uh, but this is an example of a screen that the Bears ran to, to Cole Komet. Um, it was always the same thing. Anytime they were in this formation with two tight ends kind of off the line of scrimmage, this was always the same screen to Cole Komet. And it always got two to six yards, and it never did anything about that. But you have uh, Darnell Mooney at the top of the screen, who's coming in a jet motion, and he's actually bringing the linebackers into the play. Which in the other play with the Packers, the jet motion was sending the linebackers away from, in the opposite direction of the play. But this route is sending the linebackers in the same direction of the screen. 
which again doesn't make any sense. Um, so you, it's just you know it's crazy that Matt Nagy was able to <laughs> remain a offensive play car as long as he as long as he did. Um, so again, that's just kind of a, one way that the uh, Bears can use Cole Komet or any tight ends or any player really just more involved in in the screen game um, to get him easy touches, get him more yards. Um, and make it easier on your quarterback, and make it easier on our offensive line as well. The other thing that the um, offense of the Packers and Rams and 49ers did better than what the Bears have done in the past is that utilize play action. Uh, the Bears were so predictable in 2021 and going 2020 and 2019 uh, with their offense, and especially their use of play action. If the Bears were throwing the ball and they were under center, it was a play action 99% of the time. If the Bears were in... Um, shotgun formation it was a play action one percent of the time it was crazy how easy it was to predict based on how they lined up um what play was going to be called or, or if there was going to be a play action i was literally by the time i got to week three i was calling out the plays of the bears and i am no expert whatsoever um so if i could do that you know opposing defensive coordinators could do that as well so it was infuriating how how they use not only how little they use play action and and motion and pre snap motions, but how ineffective they were at it and how predictable they were at it. Um, so, I looked at um, these stats for for play action. Um, so you can see Cole Komet's stats on play action. Um, he had 13 receptions for 156 yards on play action, 8.3 average at the target, 7.1 yards after catch per reception, 12 yards per reception, 7.8 yards per target. Those are good numbers. Um, non-play action, those numbers fall. So they really, uh, you know, those play, play action really opens up the middle of the field on those seam routes or those dig routes, which he didn't run enough of, slants. Um, it's important to get to use that play action. The Bears have already said they're going to be running the ball more, which means obviously means they're going to be implementing more play action. And if we look at the West Coast offense play action percentage by different offenses, you can see where the Bears ranked. They were surprisingly not last. The only team that I looked at that ran play action less was the Los Angeles Rams this past season. That's, you know, Matt Stafford. They obviously had, you know, a better quarterback, so they kind of abandoned the play action. If you look at the last couple of years when they had Jared Goff in 2020 and 2019, they were over 32% of the time running play action. Uh, but the 49ers, 33%. Even the Packers, um, whose offense is probably going to be the most similar, always ran more play action than what the Bears ran in 2021 but it's not only like as i mentioned it's not only the rate of play action that the bears had it's how they utilized the play action as well just how predictable it was um you know they were running play actions on downs on third downs third and longs you're not why are you running a play action then and not on first down just didn't make any sense but hopefully with luke getsy and madamu flus they're they'll design an offense that incorporates that play action a lot more which plays to to Cole Komet's strength, you can see his numbers on play action versus his number, numbers on non-play action. Not only does that help Cole Komet, that will help Justin Fields. Not only does it help Justin Fields and Cole Komet, that helps the offensive line. When you aren't as predictable um, with your offense, the, the defenders can't you know just know that this is a play action and, and keep going off the pass. They have to respect that run. They have to respect that you might do play action and hit them deep, which opens up just the entire offense. Um, so just the lack of lack of predictability is going to be a, a very nice and refreshing thing to see, hopefully, uh, this next season. Um, but I look to see how um, how these offenses offenses got their tight ends involved in the play action passing game, and there's a couple different ways um, you can do it um, to get easy receptions for these guys, um, easy completions for your quarterbacks. Um, so this one, this is. Um, a play action flat. This is actually an example of how the Bears did it. Um, so I have one bad example before getting into the good ones. Uh, but you can see they have uh, two tight ends at the top of the screen, two wide receivers. Um, so they're in 12 personnel. But you can see they do the play action. Cole Komet's going to fake block. He's the one. He's the tight end at the top. He's going to fake block before sneaking out into the flat. But you'll see the cornerback is never fooled by this play action. At no point did he bite. I mean, maybe a little bit there, but at no point was he out of position enough to make that worth it. And the Bears just have to throw the ball away. Now, if we look at the Packers, this is literally the exact same play uh, the Packers are running that, 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 that we just saw with the Bears, and it's literally against the exact same team. So we had that cornerback who was lined up, I believe is actually Jalen Ramsey. That's another thing. We have Jalen Ramsey, 
lined up on Cole Komet, maybe audible out of that play. <laughs> maybe maybe do something different. Um, because Jalen Ramsey is going to cover Cole Komet 99, 100%, 100% of the time. I'm willing to admit it's 100% of the time. Cole Komet is not going to get open against Jalen Ramsey. But anyway, now if we go to the, what the Packers did, um, they have, again, the exact same formation, exact same play call, exact same team. You have a different cornerback over Robert Tanyan, um, but you'll see they do the play action. And you can see, watch the the cornerback who's lined up right over the tight end. Um, he bites hard in the play action, number 43 there. He turns his back, actually, to, to the tight end. That's how confused he was on this play. And the Packers were able to get an easy completion um, for an easy yards after catch. So when you're like me and you're watching Packers games and Bears Packers games and you're always like, how the hell did that Packers player get so wide open? The Bears never have those players that are wide open like that. It's because of the scheme and it's because of how their offenses are run. And hopefully the Bears can do the same thing and get get those guys who are wide open. And you can say to yourself, oh, wow, how how the hell did Cole Komet get that wide open on that play? How the hell did Darnell Moody get wide open on that play? So hopefully that will be coming more with the Bears this year. The other thing that they did with on this play, these play actions, um, is um, they ran some counters off that as well. That's another thing that the Bears never did. They would run a play, but they would never run a different play out of that same formation to kind of counter that. They would run a play and then run the same play out of the same formation next time instead of you know running a slightly different play to can maybe catch the defense off guard. Um, they would never do that, uh, or very rarely do that. But that's something that the Packers would, would do a lot. So this is... Again, a very similar um, similar play, a um, little different formation. Um, you have a fullback in instead of another tight end. Uh, but you have Robert Tanyan, I believe, at the top of the screen, the tight end at the top of the formation. And they're going to do the same thing, play action. And instead of, and the, Robert Tanyan is going to fake block. But instead of sneaking out into the flat, he runs a drag route and is wide open for an easy completion. So again, the... It's not that the you know the Falcons didn't watch tape or anything. They were expecting him to go out into the flat. You can see that's pretty much covered, but they weren't expecting him to run that drag route. So again, that's just another way that they could do that. And then they just they took it even a step further and did stuff off that. Um, so this is again another. Oops. Let me back that up. So this is against the Bears. This is the same formation that we just saw. They have the pre-stat motion. And it's, he's, uh, Robert Tynion's going to fake block. And instead of going with the drag, he goes deep. And instead of going the way of the um, the play-action boot, he actually goes back over the middle of the field. Oops. Play that again. Uh, for an easy touchdown. So it's just those different, you know, formations, those different um, plays off of, um, you know, setting plays up for the future. Uh, so those plays that you throw into the flat for... For a five, six, seven yard game, that might not seem like much, but it's the plays that you can potentially hit later in the game because you showed in the defense that that you're gonna throw the ball into the flats so that opens up the the deep parts of the field. And this is a play that actually the I found an example that the Rams run, but it's a similar concept. But this is a great play to run off of that drag route. So we have the play action, and you have Tyler Higby who um, who blocks at first before running that drag, and then he actually turns that drag into a wheel route. So again, these are all the same formations, and it's just building and building off of those different plays to set the defense up for a big play later on in the game. And this is an example of a big play that you could potentially have. And this is something that just involves straight speed. This isn't something that involves Holcomet, you know, juking a guy in the open field, or Holcomet creating separation by himself. That's not something that he's going to be able to do consistently in the NFL. But he does something. this is something that Holcomet could do to to affect the game um, just using his size and his speed straight line speed so um, so they have all that going for them. that use of play action is going to be very helpful for everyone involved um, I'm really excited for them to do that and then I just have one more example of um, a way that the Packers got their tight ends involved in easy catches um, easy easy routes here um, so this is an RPO run pass option you have um, Robert Tanyan lined up off the line of scrimmage, but he's the tight end there on the left side of the formation. And then you have Equ Equinamia St. Brown in the slot there. And what's going to happen is um, Robert Tanyan is going to run into the flat on the RPO. And Equinamia St. Brown is going to run a little curl 
and just get in the way of the defender, um, allowing um, Robert Tanyan to get open. So we can see what that looks like. So watch the top of the screen, the tight end, and Equinemia St. Brown right next to him. St. Brown is just going to get in the way um, and prevent the cornerback or linebacker from getting over to, to Tanyan in time. And you just pick up an easy 7 8 yards. Um, so that's another way they can kind of use Cole Komet. Um, but yeah, the, the key is going to be getting Cole Komet easy receptions. Um, I don't think he needs to have, uh, he's going to have that 800 yard 8 TD season, but I think there is definitely room for him to improve on the numbers that we saw. The scheme definitely held not only him back, but everyone back. Um, so just the fact that he's in a different scheme, um, I would expect him to be a more efficient player, if not a, maybe a more productive player. Um, and what I mean by that is his stats might not be much better than that 60 receptions for 612 yards. Maybe a little bit better, uh, maybe even a little bit worse, but I think his advanced stats, his average, um, his yards per reception, his yards per target, his yards per route run, um, his average depth of target, his yards after catch per reception are all numbers that can be greatly improved just by being in a different offense. Um, so again, I took a look at, I averaged out those numbers of those tight ends um, in these different offenses to kind of get an idea of what a stat line for Cole Komet could look like. Um, so you can see the average West Coast tight end that I had at a 12.8% target share. Um, so that would be 79 receptions for 61 yards, 684, uh, sorry, 61 receptions for 684 yards, 6 TDs. Not too much more than what Cole Komet had last year, 60 receptions for 612 yards. Obviously, it's, you know, a good amount more yards, but about the same reception. Uh, but you can see the catch rate is greatly improved by 10%. Yards per reception is better. Yards per target is better. Yards after catch per Catch perception is better. Yards per out run is better. Um, so again, I don't expect him to have that 800 yard, eight t 10 touchdown season or whatever people might be ex expecting. I expect his numbers, his raw numbers, his receivings, his receptions and yards to be about the same. But I expect him to be a much more efficient player in this new offense, just based on what we've seen from other tight ends in the same offense. Is Cole Komet really worse than Robert Tanyan? I don't think so. Is Cole Komet worse than Josiah DeGuara? No, probably not. Is he worse than George Kittle? Absolutely, yes, hundred percent. Is he worse than Taylor Higby? Tyler Higby? Yeah, probably. But he's not that much worse than Tyler Higby. I think he can still be a productive tight end in the NFL, um, just based on. And this scheme is really going to help him kind of get to the next level. Um, so if we look at those um, those um, those projected stats that I have and compare it to the other tight ends in twenty twenty one, I had that graphic earlier. Um, so again, targets. So they have his projected, let me take this other one out there. So we have the projected um, stat line at the top. Um, we have his um, stat line in 2021 below that. Um, actually, I want to go back to this because I have the average OS goes tight end. But I also took, did the same thing and I took George Kittle out because George Kittle was such an outlier. Uh, I didn't think it was kind of fair to include him in that because he had, you know, 100 receptions for 1,000 yards or whatever it was. Pokemon's never going to get that level. So I took the same average minus Cole Komet, and I think that's a much more realistic um, stat line for Cole Komet uh, in 2022. So then I used that one to look at his projected stats um, and compare that to where he would rank in 2022 with that stat line. Um, so if you look at the targets and receptions, he's uh, obviously he has less targets and less receptions than in 2021, but the yards is higher. The TDs would be tied for eighth amongst tight ends. The yards per target would be eighth. Um, 8.37 yards based on this information. Catch percentage would be fourth among tight end. Yards after catch perception would be sixth. Yards per route run would be eighth. Um, so you can see, even though his stat line might not be, you know, some that he might not take that next step in terms of receptions and yards, he could easily take that next step in terms of yards per target, catch percentage, yards per after catch perception, yards per run. Those advanced stats that were really holding him back in 2021. Um, and that would be, a, to me, be a very successful year for Cole Komet. If he finishes with 58 receptions for 628 yards, 60 Ds, and those those advanced stats on, a, on less targets, um, I think that's a win uh, for Bears fans. That's a win for the Bears. Um, and I think that's a very easily obtainable goal for Cole Komet. Um, I don't think he's ever going to be a top five tight end. Um, I think, you know, best case scenario, he's at the back end of the top 10. Most likely he's a top 12 to 15 tight end. 
and you know that's okay too maybe that doesn't live up to your hype of him being a second round draft pick but i think we kind of have to leave that in the past and just expect him to be that top 8 to 12 tight end and kind of just sit in that area um for the next eight years which i think would be i'd be ecstatic if that happens um, i think um he's much more closer at this point to being out of the league than being a top eight tight end so uh, i'd be definitely happy with that all right that's all i got a uh, little bit of a quicker podcast uh this week um you can expect more i'm gonna have an article posted as well based on this information uh, make sure to follow me on twitter cfc bears i'm gonna be tweeting out a lot uh, make sure to subscribe to the podcast We'll be doing at least a weekly podcast going up, going forward, um, at least through the off season, and then probably ramp up. Um, once the season starts, I'll probably do a couple, uh, maybe a couple shorter ones during the season. Uh, so make sure to subscribe. Make sure to follow me on Twitter. If anyone is interested in writing for the site, I'm, I would love to have more people uh, writing. I've had a couple of guys send me articles for guest posts, which have been great. Thank you for everyone who's done that. Thank you for everyone who's reached out. Uh, but if you are interested in writing, let me know, and then we'll get that set up. Um, until next time, bear down.